Children's Director, Jewel Cannon. Let's give her a hand clap of praise. She's going to bring the message this morning. She's a little nervous, so if you would, could y'all reach your hands out to her? Reach your hands out to her. Reach your hands out to her. Yes. To her. To her. To her. And I want you to say, preach, preacher. Preach, preacher. And let's see what we get. Good morning. Good morning. I need to say, Coach Jay, I said no surprises, but <laughs> you still did it. And it's, it's fine. Um, it's good to be back in the house of the Lord. I missed you all dearly, and I hope you all had a good Thanksgiving. Coach Jay, thank you for the introduction. Remnant has been a growing place for me and my call, and I'm grateful for my experience here. So I tried to avoid it, but it's time for me to preach and really tell you all what God has placed on my heart. Pray with me before I begin. God, thank you for the opportunity to share your message to your people. I ask that your spirit flows through me. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my tongue be pleasing in your sight, God. Amen. So I am a fan of the Gospels, and I love studying what Jesus did on earth. I love the encounters he had, and the Gospel, according to Mark, tells us of the encounters and the life of Jesus very well. Mark is the shortest yet oldest gospel. It is very straight to the point. The gospel according to Mark is also very, very hectic. Jesus travels back and forth throughout the Galilee region on a boat, and he's healing and he's teaching and working day and night. There is barely any room for any breaks, and his disciples are journeying with him and witnessing all the miracles. Now, all of this is happening leading up to chapter 5. It starts off with Jesus healing a young boy who had many demons. He then goes to the other side of town and docks the boat, and there's a huge crowd gathered there waiting for him. Everyone wants to see Jesus. They, some are in need of a healing, and some just want to hear from our Lord. In the midst of all this, a church leader comes to Jesus and begs him to heal his dying daughter. Jesus agrees to do this, but as they're on the way to his house, the crowd is so pushy, right? And then you have my girl, the woman with the issue of blood who comes and touches the hem of his garment. Today, we won't focus on this unnamed woman or this particular act of healing because we need to talk about the interaction Jesus had with the church leader. But I'm setting up the scene for you all. This man stands out from within the crowd and is leading Jesus to his house. But before they could reach his house, a desperate woman with bold faith reaches out and takes power from Jesus. So Jesus has to stop and tend to her and do what he does best. He heals her. So now that we set up the visuals and we're in the middle of Jesus healing and back to Jairus' house, let's continue on in Mark chapter 5, verses 35 to 40. While Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of the synagogue leader. They said, your daughter is dead. There is no need to bother the teacher anymore. But Jesus paid no attention to what they said. He told the synagogue leader, don't be afraid, just believe. Jesus let only Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, go with him. When they came to the house of the synagogue leader, Jesus found many people there making lots of noise and crying loudly. Jesus entered the house and said to them, Why are you crying and making so much noise? The child is not dead, only asleep. But they laughed at him. So Jesus had to throw them out of the house. I want to talk to you all on the subject of believing when it seems unreasonable. The title of my sermon is Just Believe. Many times we fall into dark places and we start to lose hope and it gets hard to believe that things will get better. And if depression and anxiety starts to set in, that ushers in isolation and helplessness. You start to think that God is far away and does not hear your plea. 
Personally, I start to believe that I'm non-existent to God and falsely believe that he won't make a way out of no way. As if God hasn't been a way maker in the past. As if that's not on his resume. But sometimes when we get stuck in dark places, it's hard to think of a memory in which God has provided before. So as I was thinking about what text I would use today, the Holy Spirit placed this text on my heart. Like I mentioned before, I am always intrigued by the people who go to Jesus or the people Jesus goes to. What is it about them that makes them stand out in a crowd? God, why this person instead of the others? Lord, why are you having this interaction or partaking in this specific miracle? What can we learn from it? Well, Jairus and his circumstances can teach us a lot about our relationships with God. I believe Jairus' posture and position slash title is a major reason why as to why Jesus chose him on this day. You see, earlier in the chapter, when Jesus docked, Jairus came to him and fell at his feet. He begged him to come and heal his dying daughter. He invited Jesus into his struggle. I think we shall all be in that position. There's nothing wrong with lying at Jesus' feet or pleading and telling Jesus about our struggle. And now let's explore his title. Jairus is a church leader. He may be a deacon or a pastor, or he might be a children's director or help with technology in the back of service. Regardless, he's a Christian. He's someone we couldn't consider religious or spiritual. He's someone that knows the Lord and has some sort of relationship with him. Jairus knows what it's like to know God, but finds it hard to have faith or believe in a hard time. This man in Mark 5 shows us how real it is to be a Christian or spiritual or a seminary student who knows God, but is struggling with feeling faithless or doubtless. Inflation is crazy, the job market is shaky, and we think we should be where we want to be in life, but we're not, and it becomes unreasonable to believe. So then we begin to lose faith in God. We drift away. We start thinking like the people from Jairus' house who said, there is no need to bother the teacher anymore. Well, yes, there is. There's always a need. God would never get annoyed with our plea or asking for help. God would never get tired of you bothering him. In fact, you can't even bother God. The next verse tells us that Jesus paid them no attention and spoke directly to Jairus and said, don't be afraid, just believe. That's good news. If you notice, Jesus is standing right there with Jairus when he gets some of the most devastating news in his life. It is a, isn't it amazing to know that even in our trying times, God is still there and ever-present help in times of trouble? God will never leave you nor forsake you. God was right there with Jairus in his struggle as he is with us when things get complicated. You see, I'm trying to convey to you all that God is personal, closer than ever, lowly. A God that sits high but looks so low. And there's no need to be afraid of going to God for anything in prayer. I know last week Coach Jay preached about how when the big trials and tribulations hit us and even the small things, you could pray about it because that's what he says in his word. Yeah, God is so big and righteous and holy and so mighty. And if you experience church hurt or have a rocky relationship with him, you might think that he's scary. But God is not like that. God is so lowly and comforting, and God is present as he was with Jairus. Do not be afraid to put your hope in Jesus, because he's closer than a brother and walks beside you in your struggle. Amen. So back to the text. After, Jair after Jesus reassures us not to listen to the people and to just believe, they finally make it to his house. And I know Jairus must have been relieved, yet a bit sad, because... I mean, this was an all-day thing from meeting Jesus at the dock to leading him back to his house and then stopping because of the woman of the issue of blood. And then people come and say, your daughter's dead. He has to be sad. So he's feeling a lot of emotions at once. But the good news is Jesus is with him every step of the way. So let's reread verse 38. When they came to the house of the synagogue leader, Jesus found many people there making lots of noise and crying loudly. Jesus entered the house and said to them, why are you crying and making so much noise? The child is not dead, only asleep. But they laughed at him, so Jesus had to throw them out. I must confess, I am dramatic and sensitive. I am a crybaby, and I get moody when things do not go my way. 
So when Jesus enters this man's house and sees people crying loudly, I can easily see myself there with them falling apart, crying loudly. But I really believe, like Jesus, God sees us in our sadness and passionately and lovingly asks us, daughter or son, why are you crying? Miss D, why are you so down and worried? Coach J, why are you full of anxious thoughts? Your dreams aren't dead and your work is not in vain. Why are you sitting in misery? Why have you become so comfortable with doubt? Your hopes aren't dead and your life is not awake. It is on pause or that thing you're believing and trusting God for is in preparation, it's in the works. Do not be afraid, get out of your head and just believe. Lastly, I know when you're ambitious and very hopeful for something, it starts feeling almost unattainable and unreachable and unrealistic. It starts seeming like it's too big to even grasp and all you could think is, nah, that's so silly. And you might laugh or your close ones may laugh at it. Well, I want to urge you not to laugh or think what you are believing in God for is so silly because as long as it's in the lines of his will, it's yours and bound to happen. You see, after Jesus boldly declared that Jairus' daughter was not dead, only asleep, or our hopes and our needs weren't dead, but only on layaways, the folks in his house laugh. How do you go from crying to laughing? I don't know, but if Jesus didn't kick them out of his house, if I was Jairus, I would have kicked them out of his house. <laughs> but they laugh because it seemed impossible, and that's a bit ridiculous because they were hearing from the king of kings the man who walked on water, and the man that even the winds and waves obey, and demons tremble when they hear his name. This man who was fully human and fully divine, who was causing a ruckus of healing all over the land, healing people. The woman at the well, the man with the disease, the one with the issue of blood, and the man at the pool, and so much more. Jesus, the son of God. So, Unfortunately, when you play stupid games, you win stupid prizes. So Jesus had to kick them out <laughs> in order to perform the healing of bringing his daughter back to life. So what we learn from this instance is don't think that God won't do the unexpected. He will. God will show up and change your situation so fast. It is not a game and it's not silly. Don't be afraid or laugh. Also, get rid of the distractions as Jesus did and get what you need. Jesus took only the three disciples that could handle it and some of Jairus family members and performed the healing. So get what you need. The people in your corner who will comfort you and be there for you. The scriptures that encourage you and get ready for God to do the work. I challenge you, Remnant, to not be afraid for everywhere you go, God is with you. Just believe and as Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. once said, only when it's dark enough can you see the stars. Your trying times are the times in which you should believe. So, let us close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the word that was delivered to us today. God, I ask that you help our unbelief. Let us grow in our faith and continue to believe and dream. We love you. Amen. So for the benediction, we're going to do the prayer that we learned in Children's Church. So I'll start it and just repeat after me. May the Lord, May the Lord wash, between wash between me and thee, me and thee while, we are absent, while we are absent, one from another. One from another.